Okay, everyone should be hearing me. Uh, this is Howard Mann. Welcome to the webinar. I think we'll have a short session today. I'm not going to show all of these cases, but I'll start off with this one. So to give you a bit of context for this case, it is a patient uh, that had, as best I can tell, the discovery of a left lower lobe nodule on a cardiac CT, and that was in 2021. And as I'll show you in a moment, there is a follow-up that was reported in January. And the reporter uh, reported the nodule, which you can see here in the anterior lower lobe. Um, which seems to be a little bit bigger, but reported it as in terms that was pretty suggestive of a tumor or very suspicious for a tumor. So let me show you some interesting features of it. So now I'm going to just show you this. Actually, I want to go back. Let's start with this one. And here I'll need to zoom in. I'm going to try and find another one with thinner cuts if I can. So bear with me. Now the image is noisy, but let me see if I can bring this out, like something like this. I hope that you can appreciate that in looking at the attenuation characteristics of this nodule, that there is a difference between the periphery and the central portion. The central portion here being of relatively low attenuation, and this portion here being soft tissue, or perhaps even to some degree enhancing soft tissue. So keep that in mind for a moment. And now I want to bring alongside this one. And let me just try to unlink these so that I can leave that one like this. And let's go to that one. Now, if you just report it as a nodule that's bigger without trying to look at the attenuation of it, and there I just clicked one button, and now you'll see that again there is a difference between the periphery and the central portion of that nodule. But even more than that, as I do this, you'll see what has happened to that peripheral portion. That is, it's calcified. And it's like the entire periphery has calcified substantially, leaving the interior like this. So one of the things I thought of when I saw this is this general notion of this entity. Now, this is a report going back to 2003 talking about the enhancing rim compared to the center as a new sign of a benign pulmonary nodule. And I wasn't able to read this uh, since last night, but they basically described that phenomenon. And they turned out to be benign and quite a number of the patients were shown to have coxy as the etiology of it. So the idea perhaps is that you have an infection, the central portion is necrosis, and then the peripheral portion that is soft tissue enhances, and that being a sign of a benign nodule. Now, they didn't describe the calcification, but I'm really intrigued by it. 
So David or Maya or anyone else, what do you think? I think that the soft tissue component is calcified and this, this clearly is benign. And it's an intriguing finding. Yeah, so that, you know, this would, looks as if it's trying to be those concentric calcifications that goes with histogranulomas and things like that. So I think you, I think you got the process underway here. Yeah, it's okay. not like laminated because there's not multiple rings, but for sure right. that periphery is substantially calcified mm -hmm. in that interesting fashion, just like that. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a nice thing to pick up. I don't think I've seen that before, for sure that I remember. I've seen laminated calcifications, but maybe not one quite like this before. So I think there's a relationship between what we see here and, and the inferences we can make from the other findings. So I was able to reassure my consulting physician about that one. This is the case that I shared with some of you in terms of JPEGs, but I was able to get this from a colleague. So this is courtesy of a radiologist whom I know through Twitter. He's uh, Marcos Mestas Nunez. He's a radiologist in Buenos Aires. So courtesy of him, thank you for sharing the DICOMs with us. So here is the lesion. And as we scroll up and down, we can see its location in relation to the medial and posterior hemidiaphragm. And its shape conforms to that diaphragm. It's just an area of opacity. And I can't, we don't see the diaphragm, the cruz separate from it. Sure, it sure looks like in focal intradiaphragmatic process here, laterally continuous with normal hemidiaphragm muscles. So a focal expansor lesion in there. Now, just visually, it doesn't look like water, but this turned out to be, according to Dr. Mestas, pathologically proven intradiaphragmatic bronchogenic cyst, presumably a cyst cystic lesion that turned out to have presumably a lining of respiratory epithelial. So mesothelial cysts have been described in relation to the diaphragm and inside the diaphragm. And this is, as it turned out pathologically, to be exactly that, a developmental cyst, bronchogenic cyst. I don't know if, obviously, if on removal it actually had fluid-like contents that came out because sometimes we know bronchogenic cysts, the contents, the fluid may be of high attenuation because it's quite proteinaceous and sometimes even milk of calcium and calcified contents in a developmental cyst. So intradiaphragmatic bronchogenic cyst. I've never seen that before. Me neither. I mean, that's, that's really great. Okay. And then when you were sharing this case, Travis came up with an article that showed a similar lesion, but I think it wasn't as big as this. So it, it has been reported. It's not yes, it's not unique, but it certainly is unique in my experience. Yeah. I think the case that Travis, and you can find it by just uh, searching the internet, the lesions that he showed were more clearly fluid in attenuation, right? I think yeah. the one that he showed more obviously the fluid filled cystic structure. So that is really interesting. All right. All right, let me show this one. I thought they had the CT or I was trying to get the CT in this patient, which confirmed the presence of what I'm going to show you, which is really subtle. So what I need to do here is bring up two images and that shouldn't happen. So let me try and fix that for you and bring that back to default mode. Let me get my timing here, 2014, 2009. So let me now mag up here because the finding, of course, very reasonably will go undetected because it's really subtle. And let me see if 
here I can show it to you okay so what I'm going to do here is obviously displayed in a way that you wouldn't look, be looking at it on a monitor in the course of daily reading but I hope you can appreciate there are two little dots there there's one there and one there and let me bring up this one and I'm going to change the window width and window level and you can see in terms of location it's the same place so here we have trachea to right main bronchus left main bronchus two dots one dot there one dot there one dot there one dot there so present for how many years quite a few so that turned out to be a two tooth denture that the patient obviously aspirated at some point around about here who knows exactly when but apparently he wasn't symptomatic from it for many many years and i don't know how it was ultimately discovered but it's been there for at least five years and obviously it's a little bit bigger than this but that is a two tooth aspirated denture sitting in the right main bronchus for all that time and i guess it's the it's the opacity i'm not quite sure what makes the opacity but there you can see it again 2013 sitting in the same place so that's kind of curious isn't it eventually they took it out so howard do you think you were seeing uh, a piece of plastic bigger than those two little bright dots I, think I, 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 could, I could sort of intuit a sort of an elliptical thing there yeah so i think i i saw the ct somewhere but then i lost it i don't know what happened to it but okay. there was obviously the plastic part of the denture and then the mm -hmm. two little teeth were the central part of the denture so the whole thing was a couple of centimeters in length right and then two teeth in the middle of the plastic denture yeah i'm not quite sure what what the opaque portion is exactly yeah i wish i had that ct to show you but i don't all right let me show you this case We have multifocal and multilobar pulmonary opacities of slightly different shapes and sizes, mostly in the right lower lung. What I want to show you now is the abnormality related, at this time at least, in relation to some of the pulmonary vessels, but particularly down here. So notice that we have an abnormality of a branch of pulmonary artery and here as well. Some are pacified lumen, but otherwise not. But I want to go on now to show you before I show you that ultrasound to a later point in time as this evolved. And look at this now at a later point in time where there is substantial abnormality present within and enlarging distending and occluding the right lower lobe arteries here and you can see how much is actually present in that vessel and how little contrast medium is around it so that's a really dramatic finding at that time and let me see if I have another one. No, I'll show you just that there. So now let me show you that if we go back to the previous, some context, because that isn't plain old everyday acute bland pulmonary embolism. And look at that. 
So yes, there's motion and sharpness, but here is very large vegetation or vegetations on the tricuspid valve. So now you can see how these vegetations would embolize off and end up in the pulmonary arteries. That's a very large vegetation. Here's a ultrasound. And these images show the size of that vegetation or vegetations on the tricuspid valve. So this is, of course, infective endocarditis with embolization into the pulmonary arteries on the right side of large fragments of those vegetations, probably one of the biggest vegetations that I've seen. Here we see it again. and extensive abnormalities and complications of that. At surgery, not only did they take out that valve, but they actually, I think by the time they went to surgery, by description, it sounds like there was even more vegetations in the pulmonary artery and they did an arteriotomy and actually physically removed some of those large vegetations at the time of surgery as well. Very likely areas of pulmonary hemorrhage may be infarction here. Do you like that, Dave? You've seen bigger ones? Yeah, that's beautiful. And you can see that it's obstructing the pulmonary artery flow, so the lung is not enhancing at all. Oh, the, yeah. All, yeah. All that consolidation distal to it is just not getting any blood. Yeah. Or very little. Yeah. Wow. Pretty dramatic, huh? Let's see if I had another. Two veggies. Everybody should eat their veggies all the time. There's an ultrasound. You can see that wow. vegetation's bouncing around on this ultrasound as well. Huge, huge, huge. Bad. Okay. Another interesting case. So let me give you a story here. Patient with episodes apparently of unexplained abdominal pain. And there is a history of childhood surgery. He had a transposition. He eventually had a arterial switch procedure in childhood. And that accounts for the fact that we see small sternal wires, big heart, and findings consistent with prior surgery in the chest. So that's some background. Now, let me show you. Let's see if... Let me go here in time. Okay, so here is a scout topogram. You can see here at the time, this is from another hospital. You can see very nicely from the tech, abdominal pain, no bowel movement, bowel obstruction. Okay, so let's go and look at that. CT. So here we can see that he's got very dilated bowel. And you can see the location of the bowel that's very distended, contains contrast medium on this CT exam. And then let's take a look and see where the obstruction is. And I find the coronal and sagittal very helpful. So you can see here, we can see some bowel going in this direction. And I also noticed surgical material related to that diaphragm. So there wasn't a history of that, but um, undoubtedly there was at some point in time, for some reason, a surgical procedure involving this portion of the diaphragm. But you can see now we can actually trace the loops of bowel going into this area through a defect right here. And you can see sort of that closed loop right there, or at least bowel going up there through that defect at the time he has this obstruction. Let me see if I can find another one that shows the same finding, which will be here. So here we can see, if I scroll through there, air in the colon that's gone through the defect yeah, you can get a feel for the size of the defect right here. So he's got a residual defect through which bowel herniates, 
presumably intermittently producing at the time he came here obstruction of his bowel and he had surgery that confirmed that defect and they fixed that defect so I don't know what happened to that diaphragm in the past but he certainly has got a defect there and there is transdiaphragmatic herniation of bowel so the diagnosis was made let's see Obstruct. That was a nice collar sign too on that. Yeah. Yeah. Coronal CP. Yeah. Patient noted to be involved in diaphragmatic hernia. Let's go back, say, to the coronal again. Let's have a look. All right. Let's just look at the SAG, see what it looks like. Okay. This, oh, this shows it quite nicely, doesn't it? Look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's your defect. Yeah, you can see a little loop of bowel going in there, a little bit obstructed, a bit distended with air. And you can see the narrowing of the lumen, bowel going in, bowel coming out, and not distended bowel there. So intermittently, this probably maybe slips in and out until it doesn't. And then you present with substantial obstruction. Ah, that's a nice image right there. So there's a bit of mesenteric fat there too, right? Yeah. Yeah, it looks a little edematous too. Yeah. There was no comment about surgical material in relation to the diaphragm. There was sort of this obscure comment about, we think the patient may have had multiple thoracostomy tubes um, in relation to the prior surgical procedures, and maybe one of the thoracostomy tubes injured the diaphragm, which could be true, but I'm pretty sure I can see surgical material. So there was an intervention of some kind right there in the past as well. So that had to be fixed again. Okay, let's go to a nice classic sign in chest radiology. Here is substantial abnormality involving the right lower lung. And using the two projections, we can see that we have extensive abnormality in the lower lobe associated with areas of cavitation as well. And here is a nice bulging fissure sign on the lateral projection. So the bulging fissure sign, I'm not sure we teach that, we've taught that forever in chest radiology. And usually that's ascribed to a bad pneumonia um, where there's so much consolidation that it also bulges the fissure between lobes. And certainly we can see that here, but this is more than just consolidation. This is clearly a necrotizing pneumonia, not just an ordinary bad pneumonia. Um, I think classically this was ascribed to, if I remember correctly, let me go back here, try to fix what's happening here, to Klebsiella pneumonia, but I think any bad pneumonia can do that. So there it is. And you can see that there's extensive necrosis, extensive liquefaction abscess in that area. And I don't think they ever cultured a bug in this patient, which is not uncommon nowadays in patients treated with antibiotics. But bulging fissure sign, and not just an ordinary pneumonia, but an extensive necrotizing pneumonia with abscesses doing that. But otherwise a pretty classic bulging fissure on the lateral projection. So a nice teaching case of that. All right, um, we've been showing, I've been showing quite a few of these recently, these diaphragm fluoro cases, because they are very instructive. So I've got a nice case to show you. This is an unfortunate occurrence. The patient has a pacemaker at time X. Um, unfortunately, during extraction of a wire, <clears throat> a substantial injury was caused to the superior vena cava, necessitating an emergency surgical procedure, which turned out to be very complex and very complicated, um, as you can sort of intuit from this post-operative radiograph. And on follow-up radiography, you'll see that I don't have a radiograph to show you, but you can easily appreciate what the radiograph would show. 
which is elevation of that right hemidiaphragm, which is new from the preoperative or pre-procedure radiograph. So given the nature of the surgery and the injury, very consistent with injury to the right phrenic nerve causing this. So let me show you a nice example of fluoro. So we're going to lateral fluoro. And I'll just play this. This is normal breathing. Give you a feel for the absence of normal motion of that elevated right hemidiaphragm. And it's elevated all the way front to back, back to front. And I'm going to try and move this control here because I want to slow the rate at which this scrolls. But I'm OK, I can move it side like that. Okay, let's go to the deep breath. So let me play that and slow this down a bit. So you'll see the deep breath is going to come towards the end right there of that sequence. So I'll let it play one more time. So typically I will give the patient the instruction to take the deep breath at the appropriate time. So like about now I will say, get ready, take a deep breath. And you can see what we see there. You'll see that there's substantial elevation of ribs in the sternum appropriately. But again, absence of appropriate motion of that right hemidiaphragm with that single deep breath. And then here we'll get the sniff. So again, you'll see I'll be giving the instruction. Whoops, that's a bit too fast towards the later part. Usually I, I give the timing when at the end of expiration. So you may have seen that there. So I'll let it play one more time. And the sniff will come about now, right there. So I'll stop that. You saw that. Sorry. So let me just go back and go all the way towards the sniff, which is going to be here. So for trainees that are watching, this is a very nice example of paradoxical elevation with the sniff there. Back right there. Yep. So a couple of things. One is uh, if this were eventration, which could result in a similar degree of elevation on the lateral view, when the person sniffs, you would see that the posterior part of the right hemidiaphragm, the elevated hemidiaphragm, is still working and would, would resist the um, paradoxical motion, but the the weaker even traded part anteriorly would move paradoxically. So sometimes you actually get this, this uh, downward motion posteriorly, but upward motion anteriorly, this kind of rocking motion of the of the even traded hemidiaphragm. So just to emphasize again, paradoxical motion indicates relative weakness. It does not have to be paralysis. So a weak hemidiaphragm that's not paralyzed will move paradoxically. So paradox means weakness, not necessarily paralysis. Yeah. And that depends on which portion of the diaphragm is very thin with even tration. It's usually it's usually the, the anterior portion, but occasionally it involves the posterior portion. So you have to look at the sagittal projection if you have a CT mm -hmm. for eventration to try and perhaps anticipate, and it's not applicable in this case in the same way, anticipate um, motion that you might see. The diaphragm mm -hmm. here is thin throughout. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we've seen a number of these um, recently. I'm not quite sure why, but a very typical case of hemidiaphragm paralysis from phrenic nerve injury in the context of a complicated surgery. I'm not sure if I've shown this one before, but it's such a nice example that I'll show it to you, of course. So let's go and pick out a radiograph like this, which when you look at that looks just Fine. So this goes back to August of 2021. And here I'm going to show you, go forward in time, bring in these. 
and I'll scroll through this make it a bit bigger in the usual way so particularly for trainees just look at the attenuation of the lungs in particular look also at the bronchial tree I'm going to narrow the window width here to try and bring out a finding as we go down so again look at the attenuation of the lungs as well as bronchi now this is very very abnormal so this is mosaic attenuation but the lungs are so very abnormal that there are relatively few areas of relatively normal lung so again we're trying to discern a difference in attenuation between areas of the lung like maybe here and here that are relatively white compared to these other areas in here that of course are relatively black and I hope you can appreciate that there but let me just scroll through there one more time to show you that this mosaic attenuation is present diffusely throughout the lungs with respect to the central bronchial tree we don't have bronchiectasis actually but we do have bronchial wall thickening and what's also interesting and I've seen this sometimes in this entity which is constrictive bronchiolitis in this patient with rheumatoid arthritis I've also seen this kind of finding where when you get to the more distal generations of segmental bronchi these are not bronchioles that sometimes there's also intraluminal material presumably secretions in their lumens so we can see that these bronchi going all the way out towards the bronchiolar level are also pretty abnormal and when you get out to about here you're beginning to see some bronchiolar abnormality not the obstructed bronchioles but there's some interluminal secretions and I've seen that sometimes in constrictive bronchiolitis I'm not sure why I see it sometimes and why I don't um, but sometimes we also see proximal bronchial dilatation which this patient doesn't really have but otherwise has findings typical of constrictive bronchiolitis so let's look at a couple images here I think on this particular image where the airway is collapsed you can see the mosaic attenuation but the degree of obstruction here is so bad oh you can see it here a lot of air trapping in here that <clears throat> normally in the time that uh, the technologist gives the patient to expire you may not get much in the way of emptying of the lungs which is a potential pitfall but otherwise findings very typical of constrictive bronchiolitis in this patient any comments David pretty pretty classic huh that is so extensive in this person I mean there's there's not very much normal lung here at all yeah so sometimes lung that's nice and clear is it's too clear it's actually pathologic and there the vessels are so scrawny in those black areas yeah so yeah very this true. is a I don't think I've seen very many cases with this much constrictive bronchiolitis yeah yeah and so this this was attributed just to the rheumatoid arthritis not to yeah. gold therapy or anything like that correct as far as as far as I know got it this will find look at this in the uh minip let's see what that kind of looks like so I'm going to go to minip and I'll just um make it about oh, three four millimeters thick change the window width let's see if the mosaic attenuation shows up of course in a slightly different way but you can see it here too that there's a difference in the attenuation of the lungs in different portions of the chest like there for example wow All right, I think I'm going to reserve the rest of my cases for another time, if it's okay with everyone. Thanks for filling in for the whole show, Howard. That was wonderful. Yeah, thank you. These are great. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, thanks, everybody. Until See you next week. Time. Next time. Okay. All right.